Psalm 2. It's a very contemporary psalm for what's happening in our world and in our nation today. If you're like me, there are times when it just seems like the world in particular in America is becoming unhinged. Our culture has descended into the pattern of Romans chapter 1. If you look at that pattern, what the Apostle Paul reveals there when he says that, you know, men hold the truth and unrighteousness, the fact that in our country we've seen the sexual revolution, we've seen now that homosexuality is mainstreamed in our culture, and so the next step on that descending plane is what the Bible talks about, that he has given them over to depraved minds. And we certainly see that now in our culture. Men claiming to be women, women claiming to be men, and actually wanting people to believe that's what they actually are. We're being told to believe things that everybody knows is not true. It's a culture of deception and deceit. And it's just like everybody has literally lost their mind. Right has become wrong. What just yesterday was immoral is now known as nor moral. Abnormality has become normality. Perversion is proclaimed as virtue. One author I read says, it appears that all the adults have left the room. It just seems like the, the, the crazy ramblings of what people are actually thinking and actually believing and proclaiming in our culture. We should not be surprised. God has been declared dead. If he does exist at all, he certainly is not taken into account. What's really sad is that those who deny Christ and his word are increasingly viewed in this culture as actually holding the high moral ground. Those of us that believe the Bible, that believe the God of the Bible, that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we are being marginalized. We are the ones who are speaking hate speech. We are the ones who are intolerant. And this is what we see and what we face every day. So what are we to do as Christians in the face of an increasingly paganized culture? Well, I've turned to Psalm 2 this morning because my purpose in this message is threefold. I want to encourage believers to take heart, to take heart. You know, I talk to you all and we talk and, you know, and other Christians and, you know, sometimes we just feel like the whole culture is falling apart. You know, you know, what do we do? You know, we're so concerned for our grandchildren. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine this week and uh, he just was celebrating the birth of his third grandchild and expecting one more on the way. And he was saying, you know, Darren, he said, I, I fear that my grandchildren and your grandchildren will not know the America that we grew up in. And I fear that he's actually right. But I want you to take heart this morning as we look at this psalm. Not only do I want to encourage Christians, but I want to challenge Christians, and I want to challenge us all to, to stand. I believe more and more as this culture continues to descend into paganism, we're going to be called upon to take a stand. And it's probably going to cost us to take a stand. The day may come when preaching the truth about homosexuality and transgender will get you in trouble with the law. My greatest fear is that they'll put me in a cell with Pastor Lou. That's what I'm really worried about. I can probably take about anything else. I want to warn unbelievers to flee to Jesus. To flee to Jesus. There is no other refuge. You're not going to find it in this culture. You're not going to find it in anything the culture has to offer. Because there is a time of judgment coming. You know, Jesus rebuked the Jewish leaders of his day in Matthew 16. You know how to discern the face of the sky, <clears throat> but you cannot discern the signs of the times. I was eating breakfast on the back porch this morning and the sun was just coming up and I could see the, the pink in the, the clouds. Now, normally you would think that means rain, but not in my house, apparently it doesn't, but uh, maybe I don't know what your house is like or your yard. But that's what Jesus was actually referring to. He told the people of his day, you know, you can look at the clouds and you can see, you know, those signs, and, but you can't discern the signs of the times. And here was a generation living when the Messiah came, when Jesus came at his first advent. They totally missed it all. They even had the knowledge of the Old Testament. They had the prophecies of the Old Testament. 
But they, they totally missed it. Now think about us today. We have the completed canon. We have the New Testament. We, we have further revelation in the New Testament. Plus, with the New Testament now, we can understand a lot more about the Old Testament prophecies that we could never understand before. And this includes Jesus' response to the disciples' question, when will these things be? What will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? So the New Testament gives us newer prophetic revelation, many keys to understanding Old Testament prophecy, and Psalm 2 is one of those. Now Psalm 2 is a messianic psalm. What we mean by that, that Jesus Christ is the theme of this psalm, the subject of this psalm. Now, Jesus is the subject of all the Bible. We understand that. But some of the psalms are more specifically about the coming Messiah of Israel, the Lord Jesus. Now, it is true this psalm was written by David. The New Testament tells us David was the author. The New Testament actually even tells us it's the second psalm. And it's true that this psalm was probably used <clears throat> when the kings of Israel were, were, were crowned is sort of a coronation psalm as well. But the thing is, uh, no king of Israel has ever fully fulfilled the extent of this psalm. If you were paying attention, as Pam read, talking about the ends of the earth and talking about all the nations, it's very evident that David, their greatest king, and no subsequent king after that could ever fulfill this psalm, so this psalm is also predictive prophecy. When we say predictive prophecy, we mean the Bible is predicting things that are going to happen in the future. And so Psalm 2 is part of that predictive prophecy. You know, the word psalms comes from a Greek verb that basically means to strike a, a, a pluck a, or twang a string. So it's many of the psalms were created to... Uh, be accompanied with musical instruments. Uh, some have called the Psalms the hymnals of Israel. And so even though they were made to promote the true worship of the Lord God and proper praise of the Lord God, but they are filled with many wondrous prophecies, and Psalm 2 is certainly true of that. It's very significant that the Psalms are right here in the middle of our Bible. They sit between the sad history of the kings and the warnings of the prophets, and in fact, this psalm actually has a prophetic warning within it. Psalm 2 reveals the coming reign of Messiah. Hence the title of my message, The Coming Reign of Jesus. Now the structure of this psalm is really interesting because it's very easy to see the structure. It's four stanzas, three verses each. And each one of these stanzas of three verses is a different voice. So as you walk through the psalm, you see who's speaking, which is significant and helps us understand what the psalm is about. And there are certain contrasts between Psalm 1 and Psalm 2. We'll see some of that. So let's look at this psalm and look at the first stanza and understand whose voice is speaking here. Well, certainly the psalmist is, but who he's personifying. Why do the nations rage and the people plot a vain thing? First of all, we see the violent rebellion of the nations. The violent rebellion of the nations. The word rage here expresses violent commotion or agitation. The image is of a frenzied mob. <laughs> Pretty contemporary. The psalmist sees the nations as seething and foaming out rage and anger which often in the Bible you see in different places that the nations of the world are presented as a foaming, raging sea, foaming out their own ungodliness and, and their agitation. Daniel in his visions, Daniel 7 verse 2, saw the nations as a raging sea. Now the word plot here means to meditate or to deliberate on something. It's a picture of the nations of the world coming together plotting, meditating, and, and they're doing it in, in a sense of violent rage and anger against someone and something. This is a contrast to Psalm 1. In Psalm 1, you see the godly who meditate upon the law of the Lord. But here, the nations are plotting, planning, 
But in the very first verse, we find out that all of their plotting is in vain. But the psalm goes on to tell us exactly the focus of this plotting, the focus of their anger. The target of their rage is Yahweh and his Messiah. Verse 2, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Now we know that the world in general has always rebelled against God and against Christ. In fact, the initial fulfillment of this psalm, and this psalm is quoted probably more than any other psalm in the New Testament. This psalm is quoted in Acts chapter 4 when Peter is preaching his second great message and he says to the leaders of Israel, you have taken by wicked hands and you have crucified the Christ. And he quotes part of this psalm. And so it has been partially fulfilled in the first coming of Christ. But the ultimate fulfillment of this psalm will yet be in the future. It will be during the great tribulation. And it will be during the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in in Revelation 17, 18, and 19. Also, when you read the prophetic books, two in particular, the book of Daniel in the Old Testament, the book of Revelation in the New Testament, they reveal something to us about what is this plotting of the nations. The plotting is they are moving toward a final world government exerting worldwide control. This is not a fairy tale. This is not a fantasy. This is clearly what is predicted in the Word of God. And we are witnessing, even in our own country, an increasing movement toward globalization. Globalists believe that uniting people of all nations will prevent conflicts and wars. It will literally create a utopia for humanity. What it will create is not a utopia, but a dystopia. What it will create is a one world government, and at the head of that one world government, power will be, will be contained within one world leader that the Bible calls the Antichrist, absolute power in the hands of one man. And when you study the scriptures, it becomes pretty clear that this, young, this man is energized by Satan. In fact, I personally believe, though I don't, can't necessarily prove it by scripture ver, in verse, that he probably will be personally indwelt by Satan himself because Satan has always sought the worship of men. He's always sought to replace Christ. And this will be his primary tool who the Bible describes as the Antichrist. And he will seek to unite the nations through false worship, through false religion, through someone called the false prophet. And Paul speaks about this in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. And the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. So there has to be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. I don't know if we'll see it in my lifetime or your lifetime. We may. It may happen before the Lord returns for his church. It may happen soon afterward. I do not know, but what I do know is What the Bible prophecies predict is, both Old and New Testament, there has to be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. And at some point, this Antichrist, he was not content with just being a world ruler. He wants world worship because that's Satan's goal. And he will enter into God's temple and proclaim himself to be God. And what's really amazing is what the Apostle John tells us 2,000 years ago in the first century. John writes, every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. This is the spirit of Antichrist, which you have heard was coming, and here it is, is now already in the world. Is now already in the world. That was 2,000 years ago. The spirit of Antichrist is in the world, and Satan has been working his plan. Now, ultimately, we know this is under the sovereignty of God. God is the one who moves men and nations. God is the one who, think about the devastation of World War II, but what came out of World War II? 
the people of Israel coming back to the land and, and being a nation. And so God, though he allows Satan a certain measure of freedom, it's all under the dominion and sovereignty of Almighty God. And so what Paul is talking about is what is predicted in the book of Daniel and in the book of Revelation, particularly Revelation chapter 13, where John in his vision sees a beast with seven heads and ten horns rising out of the sea. Again, the sea is depictive of the Gentile nations. And then in that same chapter, John has a vision of a, another beast that has two horns like a lamb. This is the Antichrist. Now, we have to remember, these are images, these are metaphors, but C.S. Lewis said, you know, whenever you see a metaphor or an illustration in Scripture like this, please understand that it is a metaphor for a reality. And the reality is one single individual who will rule with all absolute power over the nations of the world. And it's actually going to happen. Now, I'm not one of those people that tries to take every particular high headline in, in contemporary headline and apply it to a biblical prophecy. But at the same time, Jesus said we should be able to discern the signs of the times. And so since we know the nations are raging and they're plotting and we know what their, their ultimate goal is, which they will actually accomplish for a time, is a one world government a one-world religion overseen by one man, the Antichrist. So we should be paying close attention to such trends in history. And so that's what we need to do. Some of the things you see in the Bible, people would have scoffed at many years ago, thinking, well, how could this ever happen? And yet... We see very clearly, even in our culture, where we are now and in the world, the precursor of some of these things. On February 4th, 2019, Pope Francis co-signed a document on human fraternity for world peace and living together with the Grand Imam of the Al-Azhar University in Cairo. And that's a picture of that momentous signing. The name of God was mentioned, but it's interesting that the name of Jesus Christ was omitted. The Catholic Church has stated that they want to join forces with the Muslims of the East and the West to build a world at the service of human fraternity and universal peace. Now, I went online, and you can go online, and you can read the document that they signed. And when you read the document, it sounds good on the surface, you're going to see words like unity and, you know, equity and equality and, um, you know, uh, world peace and kind of reminds me what Paul said when they say peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them. In Revelation 13, it reveals that the Antichrist is going to require people to receive a mark that no one may buy or sell without it, the mark of the beast. Many people have wondered, what in the world is that? How could that be accomplished? John Lennox, who is a philosopher, a teacher, an intellectual, an apologist, he wrote a new book called 2084, kind of a takeoff on Orwell's book, 1984. But he writes it about artificial intelligence. And, and John Lennox is a believer, and so he incorporates in his book, the book of Daniel and the book of Revelation. It's really fascinating. And he says, China is already using artificial intelligence in order to achieve social control. They are gradually rolling out a social credit system in order to check on the reliability and trustworthiness of their citizens. Each citizen is given 300 points, which can be added either for good behavior, what the, the government deems as good behavior, or it can be subtracted for bad behavior. This is an article out of The Atlantic which talks about this citizen score that China has uh, for years wanted to bring this into existence and they're actually bringing it into existence. They're racing to become the first to implement a pervasive system of algorithmic surveillance 
harnessing advances in artificial intelligence and data mining and storage to construct detailed profiles on all citizens. You do realize that if you have a cell phone or a computer, that you're already being monitored. I'm not saying you're being monitored like China is monitoring. Did you ever notice if you order something off Amazon that next thing you know pops up that something else in that same interest area? Or even after a couple of weeks or a month, some things you've, ch you've ordered will suddenly pop up again and um, China is taking it to a whole new level. They have actually not only incorporated AI in which they are massing all of this information about people's habits and what they do. They're using facial recognition software. They're putting cameras all over their country. And so the idea being that they, they say in this article that, that Beijing is literally blanketed with, with cameras, 100% of Beijing with surveillance cameras. And, and, they, and their, their goal is, they have 176 million cameras in China. Their goal is to have 450 million by the end of this year. And so the whole idea is they're constantly monitoring their cell phones, their social media. They're using facial recognition. And John Lennox goes on to say, you might even end up being denounced as a discredited person on a public television screen as you walk past it. And people in our country want to dismantle the republic for a socialist government. Yet every socialist government in the history of the world has ended up in totalitarianism and destruction and death and the taking away of our freedoms. But you see, because our culture has descended into this level of they have a depraved mind, they're, they're not thinking straight. And so there are people who are actually promoting a socialist agenda is this the kind of country that you want? Is this the kind of surveillance that you want? The taking away of our freedoms? And Lennox's idea was in, post, in talking about this is that it's very easy to see how we could be monitored, very easy to see that, and you've heard about possibly a computer chip, you know, the Bible in Revelation specifically says in your forearm or, or in your forehead, that this is not now beyond the realm of possibility. In fact, it is actually possible, and China is moving to something very, very similar. The Wall Street Journal has reported how central banks are getting closer to issuing their own digital currency, which means the dollar might face competition as the world's dominant currency. Central banks, such as the Federal Reserve, already issue digital money with the commercial banks that have accounts with them. Now, I know ostensibly it's supposedly the coronavirus, but have you noticed how many places now prefer that you don't use cash? Do you realize how easy it would be to give you a score, to give you so many points, particularly in a socialist country? Well, let's get back to the scripture here. What is the reason for this rage of the nations? Why is there so much hatred and animosity and rebellion from, the, from unsaved people, from, the, from culture as a whole, from the world against God, and particularly against Christ. Verse 3, let us break their bonds in pieces and cast away their cords from us. This is the nation speaking <coughs> concerning God and his Christ. The reason for their rage is to be free from the restraints of God's law. They want to be free from the restraints of God's law. I want to do what I want to do with who I want to do it, whenever I want to do it, and I don't want anybody telling me that I can't. In fact, I want everybody telling me they agree with that, and they not only condone that, they celebrate that. So in our culture now, we are to celebrate perversion. And if you don't get on board, then you are, you know, you're the evil person. You know, you're the bigot. You're the racist. You're the homophobe. And it's not going to get any better. In fact, I think it's going to get a lot worse. And we can see how men want to be their own masters. They want freedom without authority, which leads to anarchy. Israel was the same way, and they were judged by God. And God sent prophets, one of which was Jeremiah, 
In Jeremiah 8, 9, he said, The wise men are ashamed, they are dismayed and taken. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? Our culture has rejected the word of the Lord. So what wisdom do they have? The wisdom of a depraved mind. No wonder we see the things that are happening in our culture. Romans 1, professing to be wise, they became fools. 1 Corinthians 1, the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved is the power of God. You're going to tell me one man on one hill, one time on one piece of wood, paid the sin debt for the whole world? Is that what you're going to tell me? That is, that is moronic is the word used here. No, because that one man on that one cross is the God-man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the only one who could bring man and God together, the only one who could live a perfect life, the only one who could make a sacrifice that God the Father would accept for your sin and my sin, the one and only one, as this psalm declares. But these people are foolish to think. They can either dismiss or defeat God's plan of redemption through his son. So Christians, take encouragement. I know it's discouraging. I get angry when I see the way that uh, people treat Christians and, and what's happening in our culture. I so admire John MacArthur out in California where the governor of California has said he's closing the churches and you, know, you can't worship and you can't sing. And At first they were like us and they went along with it, though we're not under, thankfully, a mandate here in Pennsylvania, but... Um, but after they saw how ridiculous this all was, they decided to open up anyways. And, and I appreciate his stand. What's discouraging is other evangelical pastors are criticizing him. And, um, you know, he's saying, hey, better stand. You know, we've got, we've got to draw the line somewhere because it's not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. Well, let's go to the response of Yahweh the righteous response of Yahweh. Look at verse 4. What does God think of all this? Do you ever wonder that? You look at what's happening even in our country, and you kind of wonder, what's God think about this? I'm going to answer your question this morning. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what God thinks about it. Look here at verse 4. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. The Lord shall hold them in derision. This is not a comedic laugh. This is not a nonsensical laugh. This is a laugh of derision, of absolute contempt for those that would deny his existence and condemn and curse his son. The sh scene here shifts dramatically from the focus on earth and the raging of the nations, and now it, it shifts up into heaven where God is on his throne. And he views f the feeble attempts of man at rebellion with scorn and contempt. We call this anthropomorphic language. This is expressing God in human terms so that we can comprehend what he's talking about. This is a righteous scorn. This is a righteous laughter. God is not impressed with man's vain pontifications. And all I know, they're out there, and you see them, the pundits and the politicians and, 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 and the Hollywood people, and you see people mocking God and, and in the universities and denying God's existence and, and making fun of Christ and Christians. Don't worry about it. God's got it all handled. And he sits in heaven, and he laughs with scorn and contempt. But because of his great love and mercy, God is now speaking to men in grace through his word. You know, for most of us, it's a good thing none of us are God. <laughs> because, you know, we wouldn't have the patience and the grace and the mercy. I mean, I'm thankful for God's mercy and grace. Otherwise, I wouldn't be saved, nor would you be saved. We are sinners just, our sin is just as wicked as anybody else's sin. And we're no better than anybody else. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But these people who mock God and deny Christ, he still reaches out to them in mercy. And maybe you're here today and you're not sure about these things. Or maybe your parents make you come. Or, or, or maybe you're listening to the voice of the culture and say, yeah, there's some of those things kind of... Maybe we're not here by special creation. Maybe there isn't a God. 
God is reaching out to you with the message of the gospel. He's appealing to you through grace. You know, we whine about a pandemic. I, I, I wonder why God doesn't visit the plagues of Egypt on America for what's been happening here and the slaughter of millions of innocent children. Yet God in his grace for now is withholding his punishment for now. Because the period of grace will quickly, will come quickly to an end. When the judgments begin, when the prophecies begin to, to be fulfilled, the Bible seems to indicate that they will come very quickly. Even the tribulation period is seven years. Seven years? Think about the millennia of, of, of world history, and we're talking seven years? Because his judgment will be so severe that no flesh would live if God did not limit the time of judgment. The period of grace will come quickly to an end. Look at verse 5. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh, the Lord shall hold them in derision. Then, then, he shall speak to them in his wrath and distress them in his deep displeasure. Then means after a, after a time. After a time, Second Peter, uh, Peter says, the scoffers say, oh, where's the promise of his coming? All things continue as they were since the beginning. And then Peter goes on to say, but the day of the Lord will come. It will come. And it's coming. And it's a time of unprecedented judgment. The words here, deep displeasure, are literally his burning. His burning you want to get a picture of that? Read 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. Who are they, Paul? On those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's who they are. There are not many ways to heaven. There are not many saviors. There's one and only the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you reject him, this is what your future holds. Surely in eternity and likely in this life, if you live to this time of his second coming, Jesus will return. The armies of the world will come against Israel at the Battle of Armageddon, the Bible declares to us. And Christ will return from heaven, and he with the word of his mouth will destroy those armies and those who follow them. So what is God's response to all of this? His response is verse 6. Yet I have set my king on my holy hill of Zion. You know, when God says something is going to happen, it's as if it already happened. It's just as sure. And so he doesn't even put it in future terms. He says, I have set my king. Who is his king? The Lord Jesus Christ. What is God's answer to this? His answer is in a person. A person. Christ. So that answer is either for deliverance and salvation, which this psalm appeals to at the end, or that answer is judgment, but it's through his son. All judgment has been given to the son. But the great white throne, the one on the throne, will be the son. And people will have to face Jesus, whom they have denied. And so when you get to verse 7, this next stanza, it appears the Son is the one who's speaking. And the Son reveals his Father's eternal decree. Verse 7, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said to me, you are my Son, today I have begotten you. Now I realize it's difficult to understand one God, three persons, but that's what you have here. You have the Lord God, and then you have Christ. And sometime before time, this declaration was declared. You know, every now and then you go in the Bible, and it's like the curtain of heaven draws open. And you just get a peek into the throne room of God and, and, you, and into before time. And that's what you have here. Sometime, I, I, I don't know when, although I, I'll tell you what this is referring to prophetically, but this declaration was declared. This decree of God was declared. Now, the cults want us to believe that this means Jesus was created. That's not what this is talking about. 
Uh, for one thing, the, the words I have begotten convey the sense of declaring something, of exhibiting something. And we see that in Acts chapter 13, verse 33. Paul applies this to the resurrection of Jesus. He applies it even more in Romans 1, 4, declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. The idea is this. Jesus' exalted position as the Son of God was made clear, was displayed to the world, was exhibited to the world through his resurrection. Here you have a, lived a perfect life, died an atoning death, was buried, truly dead, but he was raised from the dead. We need to hear him, believe on him, obey him, follow him. There is no salvation in any other. He is the only begotten Son. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. And, 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 and what that means is that he is the one and only. He's, he's, the, he's the son of the promise. He's the son of the covenant. He's the, he's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through him. He's the one and only son and the one and only way of salvation. Now, also, this decree involves the son's exaltation, his exaltation. That's why many believe they use this psalm when they cor at a coronation of a new king of Israel. But they could not fulfill this psalm. Only Christ can fulfill it, particularly because of this verse, verse 8. Ask of me, and I will give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. Every nation... And every inhabitant of the earth is subject to the reign of King Jesus. And though people scoff at him, and though people deny him and make fun of him, God sits in the heavens and he just holds them in contempt. He holds out mercy and grace through the gospel and through the word of God in this particular period of time. Then, at some time, even in Genesis, the Bible says, my spirit will not always strive with man. God's patience, God's mercy will come to an end. And his wrath will be, the Bible uses the expression unmixed. Unmixed with what? Mercy and grace. It will be pure wrath that will descend on the nations. Zechariah 14, 9. The Lord shall be king over all the earth. In that day it shall be the Lord is one and his name is one. There is a, there is two worldwide worships coming. One is false under the Antichrist. The other one is true worship. You and I are getting a heads up on that right here this morning. It's the worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day, all the nations of the world will flood to Jerusalem to worship the king. Psalm 86, 9, all nations whom you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name. That's prophecy. That's going to happen. That's real. One day, all of heaven will shout. Here's something you might want to start practicing. We'll be there. The kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. We're going we're to shout that. We're going to sing that. That's all of the saints of heaven will be rejoicing one day when Christ takes his proper place. Verse 9. You shall break them as with a rod of iron. You shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. He's going to crush the blasphemers and the Christ deniers. Now, we need to have compassion for these people because they're blinded by Satan. God has every right for righteous indignation. The Bible says God is angry with the wicked every day. And yes, I get angry when I see these people and I hear the things they say and and how they blaspheme the name of God and the name of Christ and how they, how they uphold perversion as normalcy and they celebrate sin. I get frustrated. But I have to remember that Satan has blinded the minds of those who do not believe. And we need to pray for these people. And we need to ask God to touch their hearts. But some people are just so hard-hearted they have descended into the pattern of Romans 1 where, where God comes along and he says, fine, I give you up. I give you over to what you've chosen for yourself. He does that with individuals. He does that with nations. And I fear maybe he's already done that with America. 
unmixed judgment. Psalm 110, verse 5, The Lord is at your right hand. He shall execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the heads of many countries. That's what their future has for them, let alone their eternal damnation after they have been destroyed. Isaiah eleven four. 4, he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of his lips, he shall slay the wicked. This is, the, this is Jesus, that people want to portray him simply as the humble servant. Yes, he is, and that's part of his character, absolutely. But let's remember who we're dealing with here. This is the Lord of glory. And then think about his second coming, Revelation 19. Out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. He himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. The Old Testament predicts Jesus at the Battle of Armageddon almost as if he is treading a wine press and, the, and, and it's splattering up over, over his vestures and it's a picture of Christ just literally crushing and destroying the kings and the nations of the world. This is our Jesus. This is our meek and mild Jesus. But he is king of kings and lord of lords. And, we show, and this psalm shows us how gracious he is. Because the psalmist appeals to the rulers of the earth. The la- again, again, the psalmist wrote this. This is a psalm of David. The New Testament tells us that. But through the Holy Spirit's inspiration, the psalmist now has a message to the nations. And he has a message for you this morning. If you don't believe in the Lord Jesus as your Savior. Verse 10. Now, therefore, be wise, O kings, be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. The psalmist appeals to the rulers of the earth, but it's really an appeal to all of earth's inhabitants. You know, one day we're going to sing another song in heaven. You might want to start practicing this one, too. I don't know the tune, and I doubt doubt it will be in English. The Bible talks about the fact that he's going to bring one, one new pure language. I don't know if that's going to be Hebrew or what it's going to be. But in our Bible, we have this in Revelation 5, 9, that we sing a new song saying of Jesus, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation. There's going to be somebody from every people group in heaven, represented in heaven, standing before the throne of God, rejoicing together. So in the light of who Jesus is, in the light of what is certainly coming, it is vain to oppose his reign. The word instructed here means to chastise. It means to be warned. The leaders of the nations are being called upon to follow the Lord and and to get their people to follow the Lord. Unfortunately, we see just the opposite. When Joseph was here last week, we were talking, and he said that Western Europe has become very anti-Christian. Very anti-Christian. Many churches have closed down. You know, attacks upon churches and Christians are increasing. He says it's fascinating when you go to Eastern Europe that used to be under communist rule, and they couldn't worship the Lord. Those people are hungry for the word. And they're open to the gospel. But the people in Western Europe who had those freedoms have now turned away from what they had. And it's crossed the ocean, hasn't it? And it's come to America. And I think you're going to see that same spirit of anti-Christian and hatred for Christianity unless we have some kind of spiritual revival in our nation. And so the appeal is to bow now before the Lord Jesus Christ in believing faith. That's what verse 12 is all about. Kiss the son, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are all those who put their trust in him. Now this is in Eastern language because this little 
for us here in the West and as Americans with presidents, not kings, it's the idea of doing homage here. It's when he says, kiss the sun. It's the idea of bowing down before him. It's the idea of submitting to a sovereign. It's the idea of recognizing Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and ultimate king of all the earth, of all the universe. Bowing before him in believing faith. It's interesting, the word son here is different from the word that was in verse 7. This word has the aspect of an heir. The son who is the heir is kind of the way to look at it. And, you know, what do we know? That he's the heir of all things and that we are heirs and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. I mean, look at the alternative here. To reject the son, we may have to suffer some in this life, but, and we will have tribulation, he said, but we're going to rule and reign with Christ. We're going to inherit everything he inherited. We're not going to be little gods, but we're going to be sons and daughters of God, and, and we're going to rule and reign with him. And, and we acknowledge him now as our king. One day, everybody will. Every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, Paul says in Philippians, to the glory of God the Father. That's, that's going to happen. The question is not, are you going to bow before King Jesus? The question is, how are you going to bow and when are you going to bow? Are you going to do it willingly or are you going to be forced to bow? Hitler and Stalin and everybody is going to be forced to bow the knee before King Jesus and confess he is the Son of God. And they will hate every minute of it before they are cast into eternal flame. The way here seems to be the way we are presently going in our course of life. It seems to be he's saying, look, bow before the sun. Don't incur his anger. Unless you perish just in the, the course of your life. You're, just, you're going through life. The Bible says there's a way that seems right to a man. The end thereof is the way of death. And many believe the words but a little is probably a reference to time, not to his wrath. But when his wrath is kindled, probably the idea is very soon. Very soon. I don't know if Christ is going to come in my lifetime. I don't know that. He could come 100 years from now. He could come 1,000 years from now. The Bible doesn't indicate that. But the Bible does say, look at the signs of the times. Look at what's happening. The prophecies talk about revive Roman Empire, Europe, army from the east, China, army from the north, Russia, nations around the Black and Caspian Sea, Muslim. Do you know America is not mentioned in Bible prophecy? Some people try to press that. Nowhere to be found. The only thing that I think it could be is we could be one of the nations, the ten nations belonging to the Antichrist. I suppose that's possible. Or we have either disappeared as a world power, but we are not specifically there, although other places in the world specifically are. So could America fall before Christ returns? Absolutely. We could be turned into another casualty of socialism and ultimately communism. And I believe when these prophecies begin, they will, they will be fulfilled quickly. Isn't it interesting? Psalm 1 began with a blessing. Blessed is the man. Psalm 2 ends with a blessing. Blessed are all those who put their trust in him. So the blessing only comes to the godly person who knows and follows the Lord Jesus Christ. Have you bowed before King Jesus? Have you bowed willingly? Have you understood that yes, he is sovereign and yes, he is king, but he is a gracious ruler and he has literally given his life for you. He's paid the penalty for your sin. And yeah, I know things look crazy and we wonder how, what's going to happen in our country. We worry for our children, our grandchildren. But you know, every generation, we've had it really easy in America. The generations of Christians down through church history have had it really hard. Are we, gonna, are, are we just going to ease our way into, up into heaven? Um, 
You know, and all, with all the privileges we've had? I don't know. Will he decide to purge his church before he comes back? Because I guarantee you one thing, and I've told you this before, if persecution comes, I probably should say when persecution comes, the, the nominal Christians will be the first. You will flee the ship. And only the true Christians will remain. But down through history, the church that has gone through persecution has been the strong church. And you look inside China or North Korea, you see a vibrant church. Christians that we couldn't even stand in their shadow. We take their very life in their hands just to own a Bible or to go to a worship service. So let's uh, be encouraged. Let's stand on those opportunities when we have to take a stand. And if you are not saved, I beg you to flee to Jesus. The day of grace is not unlimited, not for you in your lifetime or not for the world in general.